big distraction so we can be very good on this video and not be distracted. Bye bye! I'm Stacy. I'm John. And this is Raw Ability, Ability Life. Life. Okay, it's afternoon. It's seven minutes past 12. So we'll just pretend it's eight minutes ago and it's morning. Um, it is technically first day today and I didn't record anything yesterday. It's because I spent yesterday all day researching and studying up, making sure that everything I know is correct and that laws haven't changed and I don't give you false information. So, there's something I need to do before I go any further, and that involves John. He's just getting me the bits and bobs. So while he does that, I'm going to explain what I'm going to do over the next three days. So, I'm going to start working on some videos that is going to help you if you are having issues with being able to... I'll explain it when he's not making a racket in the background. Oh. So, I'm going to do three videos. Um, the first video which we got today is going to be about how I've had to fight for my care over several years and how we've ended up where we are now. Um, but it's not really going to look into too depth into the laws that protect us. I will mention some but we're going to look deeper into that a bit later in case you need to use them to protect you. Um, the video I'm going to do for going up on Friday, which will be Thursday's video, or today's video, because it's confusing because I'm doing yesterday's video today, um, is going to be a video based on the laws and your rights to care and what you're entitled to. The truth, basically. Not what the social workers will tell you, but the truth. So I'm going to give you laws and things like that from the Care Act 2014 um, that will help you fight against any misjustice. And I've got to just double check that I haven't misspoke there with 2014 because I know the Care Act was updated. So it may have been... A little later but I'm sure it's 2014 right the third video I'm gonna do is regarding DRE in Pacific so it is to do with our care contribution money the money we would pay to contribution if we had the money so some of us are gonna have enough money to pay and a lot of us are not but the important factor is the DRE disability related expenses and what is a DRE a lot of the time the council are going to try and fob you off as to what DRE is and so I'm going to show you by law and by definition of what a DRE is. There is a reason I'm doing a DRE and a totally separate video and it's actually because there's a quite a lot to it. Um, it sounds like there's like a little bit to it but it's actually a real big bit to it because social services rely on us not knowing this information so that they can save that money and they can take that money from us except we need that money to live. But first, I need to deal with the biggest problem I have in info videos. The big distraction and um, nuisance. <laughs> um, 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 someone get me a bigger kitchen. Oh, your chest spins. Your chest spins. Spin around. I need a bigger kitchen. <laughs> I have to help you do this. I know you're helping me do this. Keep spinning. <laughs> Hang on, I can't go back anymore. I'm stuck on something else. <laughs> what am I stuck on? Your own self. Keep going, keep going. 
so we can be very good on this video and not be distracted. Bye bye! <laughs> Husband dealt with, we can be serious now. So I need him to straighten me up. <laughs> There's an issue here, isn't there? <laughs> right, one, two, three. This is better. Actually, I'm probably putting you too far. It looks like you're actually going this way now. I'll slip down again anyway, so... This is why I'm supposed to wear my chest harness. I'm leaning all the time. I'm leaning forwards and forwards and forwards. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm actually supposed to sit back into my chair. Um, and because I'm leaning and leaning forwards, I'm leaning over. Why am I supposed to wear the chest harness? The problem is, when you wear the chest harness, I actually struggle to do even the simplest things, even just vlogging. I'm actually glad John is still not, it's still here because the first thing I'm going to talk about is regarding how care issues to get to where we are now. And that relates in many ways to um, before, it, it kind of helps explain why we're so frustrated. Um, but it also, I hope, highlights the issues that many disabled people have that society in general just don't realise is happening. And I don't know what it's like for in other countries, but I know in the UK right now, there are the cuts for disabled people is just despicable. It is so drastic that disabled people are really really struggling they're really suffering they have become I, I want to take it back a while I want to go right back probably I would say probably 10 12 maybe 15 years ago and I'm not going to go political I'm not going to say it was when this power this government were in power or this government I ain't going there what I'm going to say is that there was a point in time where the government did a lot for disabled people. Um, big changes came into um, play in the laws to make it that, you know, places had to be uh, so much more accessible. Um, new builds had to be more accessible. Um, finally, instead of just a grab rail by a bath in a hotel, you finally saw proper rolling showers coming into place and, and, and gr proper grab bars in the right places because what's a gr how is a grab bar over the bath going to help somebody transfer onto a blooming toilet, you know? These things were starting to allow disabled people to go out and about. Um, and that was so important because what they'd also done was started to bring disabled people out of care homes and into the community. So disabled people were starting to live independently more and more and more. So more disabled people were having their own flat or they were flat sharing with one or two other disabled people rather than living in big community homes. And it was becoming more and more, uh, I don't really know what the good word for it would be, but it was more common, I guess, to see disabled people out and about, living life. And that allowed disabled people to start looking into things like education, better education, and working. Um, and it was great. I remember when I first started getting really sick and disabled, I was able to go back to college and I was able to start re-educating myself along a new line of career based on my new disabilities, my new health conditions, that I would be able to cope with that career um, based on the fact that I was in the line of healthcare. Um, I wasn't gonna be able to continue doing that when I needed to rely on a wheelchair and walking on sticks. Um, and I suffered really badly with chronic pain. So yeah, that wasn't gonna happen anymore. So I needed to change my line of work. Um, I had a real interest in dance and in drama and in still working with disabled children. So I wanted to look at doing drama therapy. So 
that's what I started my studies looking at heading towards. So I was studying theatre, but also like undermined theatre, so like that. That's a smaller part I was studying. But over the top of that, I was studying social care, um, health and social care. So both because I wanted to go to the teaching, not the, the not teaching the um, therapy side of drama, um, and. All of a sudden this world just changed for disabled people. We had access to so much. We were given so much. The benefits were livable back then, you know. It, um, they met the price of everyday living. Nowadays benefits have not changed in price from that day. I mean they go up by a couple of pence every year. Um, normally about 20p, sometimes 50p but not enough, not enough at all. When you think about the fact that the daily, the, the, the um, working wage, or live daily, the living wage has gone up by several pounds, disability benefits hasn't. So, disabled people are still being left to cope, but yet the price of their equipment hasn't, has gone up as well because Everything in the world has gone up in price, but the benefits have stayed around the same in price. So now we can get less and less and less with our disability money, but we still need to buy all of our disabled equipment with the same amount of money. Now on top of that, so back in those days, and you're talking 15, 20 years ago, I would say 15 years ago, I'd probably be pushing more 20 years ago, but regardless of it's irrelevant on how long ago it was the fact that it was there um things like your adapted bowls i'm gonna try and show you it is actually an adapted bowl it has a scoop feed so it actually is scooped here um your adapted plates your adapted cutlery don't hold the knife like i just did your adapted cutlery any kitchenware you need adapted so that that's just for your daily living this is eating and drinking this is this is necessities because adapted cups too this is eating and drinking this is necessities um adapted kitchenware so that you can prepare your meals or whether it's by yourself or with assistance so adapted knives really expensive i need to replace this um, it's blunt and i need to replace it um adapted chopping boards and things that make it so you can open the cupboards. Adapted handles. I didn't bring the whole cupboard door, sorry. I just bought one of the spare handles. Because <laughs> bringing the whole cupboard door would have been a bit silly, wouldn't it? Um, that's just some examples of the things we would have, back along, got free through OTs. So when the OT comes out, part of their job would have been to assess your needs to be able to cope on your own. So they would have assessed how, what equipment would help you to be able to eat and drink, to be able to safely prepare food, cook food. Um, so any, anything like this, which, which is, they class these as um, small adaptation objects. Um, these are not free anymore. We don't, we have to pay for these now. Now they may be small object, but when you think one cup is six quid, and one plate is bowl is five pounds. You tell me how many people out there are gonna pay five pounds for a plastic bowl. It's only the disabled community that have to because they're not made in such mass production as as something that is sold to non-disabled people. Um, so it's not as cheap. Um, these do actually come with such a things, but that's irrelevant for this video, so shut up, Stacey. Um, these things here, these are not cheap either. In fact, everything I've just shown you through the um, plates, the cups, the kitchenware and all that, that's over £100 worth of equipment there. Where's that money got to come from now? Because remember, your DLA you used to get back then when this was provided free. So now you are expected to use your DLA for that. And this has become a problem in general for everything. And this is something you're going to notice throughout all of my videos. Our DLA is supposed to pay for so much that no one is looking at the fact that DLA does not stretch that far. This measly little bit of money 
does not pay for all of this stuff that the government has taken the funding from that we can't access for free anymore but are supposed to now use our DLA for, but they haven't upped the DLA to cover it. DLA now being replaced by PIP. Mine has been changed over, but I'm still getting my head around it. Anyhow, so that is more relevant for, we're gonna look into this sort of stuff when we talk about the DRE, um, for when you claim for your contribution towards your care costs. These are all really important factors and so much more we're going to go into when we look at claiming your DRE. These are important factors. Um, but what I'm trying to get through here right now, right at the start of this three part series of, of these videos, because they do kind of all roll into one, is the fact that our disability benefits have not changed in several years and I, I really would push it back 20 years in in what in the amount of money that's not changed I'd probably go back 30 years it's not you know it's not had a major major uphill and I mean when I say major uphill I mean it needs to be added another 150 pounds really realistically for disabled people to be able to live in some kind of lifestyle where they feel they do not need to be going to food banks and yes disabled people are having to go to food banks to survive I know because we've had to do it and again not relevant for this video but it is relevant all at the same time it's so difficult the story of why we had to is not relevant but the actual information of the fact that disabled people are having to go to food banks is relevant because we should not be being made to go to food banks it's not the disabled person's fault or or that they can't go to work so why are we pushing disabled people to that breaking point of relying on food banks to feed themselves or to feed the carer that is supporting them. It's humiliating to go there to be asking for food to feed the person who is being paid to come in and care for them. And as much as somebody's going to probably come out and say, well, if they're being paid, you shouldn't feed them. That's not the way it works. <laughs> it's just not the way it works. Um, Take everything into account when we look at everything in general so the disability money has not ever changed drastically enough to cover all of the cuts in everything so it's not just the cuts in care we, that we need to take into consideration it is the cuts in everything so all of the equipment cuts all of you know everything we used to get for free we're now having to pay for and everything is expected to come out of this DLA that was there before so now this DLA has to stretch further and further and further and further but has not had a major adjustment with amounts to cover these things.
into now of where did it start for me with the fight for my care. So, I had, I did have the, the first I, biggest fight would probably be when I first asked for help, but I'm not going to go that far back because that's irrelevant to where I am now. Um, there was another legal fight for my care when I was in supportive living because I had to fight for the right for social care, but again, that's irrelevant for where I am fighting right now so I'm going to leave that section I'm going to start from when I left social care and moved into my flat where I am now about four and a half years ago it's about four and a half years ago John it'd be five years in June wouldn't it yes so four and a half years ago because it'd be five years in in June so four and a half years ago when I first moved in here Social services in Suffolk covered my care for the first six weeks. And then social services in Cambridge took over. And when social services in Cambridge took over, they took it over just as the package was. So I was receiving, oh, golly, golly gosh. Now I was not married to John at this point. I was planning on getting married to John and he was still living in America. So I was receiving a care call during the night. Uh, no, it wouldn't. They couldn't cover the night care call, could they? You had to call me to to, to get me to take my meds at 4am. So John was being my carer from America <laughs> to make sure I took my medications at 4am. Um, but I had, oh God, it must have been about 10 calls a day, mustn't it, John? Yeah. I'm trying to, trying to think, but I'd, I would have about four calls in the morning, then a lunchtime call, then a four o'clock call. No, lunchtime call would be about 12 o'clock, then I'd have a two o'clock call, then a four o'clock call, then a six o'clock call, then an eight o'clock call, and then another one later on in the evening. So I had several calls during the day because of my medication, because of my toilet needs, because of needing to get changed and showered. I needed everything doing for me. I was, I'm not allowed to cook unsupervised because of my epilepsy, because of my, um, what's it called, because of my grip, motor control. motor control, things like that, I drop everything, I have muscle flinches, so things go flying, trust me, I throw knives at John, I have yet to cut him, however, he has cut my foot, he dropped a knife on my foot and cut me, and yet I'm the one with muscle spasms, figure that one out, um, <laughs> love getting the irrelevant little snippets in there um <laughs> uh so first of all cambridge took over exact hours as they were put in by um suffolk county council so perfect however they went to deal with the payment of it and so I had to do a contribution what is it called so what they send you is a financial assessment form for community based services um it's gonna look a little something like this and uh, yeah and it's going to have a load of questions on, unfortunately I can't show you because we filled them in and that's got private information regarding me, so I don't want to share that. This is just a photocopy of it because we've already sent ours in recently. Um, I needed to concentrate on getting a lot of that done before I could do this video. <coughs> oh, this series of videos anyway, but also with that has also come in issues that has allowed us to make awareness of these issues too. So... This assessment form you will be asked to fill in and we're going to go over this form and DRE in general later on. So what I did is I filled this in. Now I'd come from supported living into my own home. Now when you're in supported living you share the bills. So you share the electric, you share the gas, you share the TV license. Um, so everything, life is cheaper. Life is cheaper in supported living because you're sharing these bills. Um, so I expected that the contribution I was paying in Suffolk, which was about £20, to be reduced to almost nothing because now I'm living on my own and expected to pay all these massive bills. So surely these would be reduced to nothing, right? 
that makes logic sense to me. Obviously not to the council in Cambridge because they decided I had enough money to pay 68 pounds and something pence a week towards my care from my DLA. That is pretty much most of my care component from my DLA. Now, just remember, I've already gone through just a little portion of disability related expenditure of adaptive bowls and cutlery that we don't get free anymore and we have to pay for. The cups that don't last five seconds. Um, I, I haven't even touched on things like the syringes I have to buy, the incontinence pads, the, the, the amount of washing you have to do, the, you know, I have not even gone down that road because that's for another video. So that's where I got with that and I had to fight him tooth for nail. Now because I had to fight him tooth for nail and I actually, that became part of my law suit with them. I don't know if you'll call it a lawsuit. It was part of my fight with the le legal fight with them, with the lawyers. One of two things. But I'm gonna now pull that side because that's gonna be a separate total video about the DRE and final assessments and how, what you can claim as DRE and and things like that i was being asked to pay an amount of money that i could not afford i'm gonna go like i said i'm gonna go i am gonna go more into those forms the info and how to fill them in and what you're entitled to and everything in another video with the laws to support it and evidence and everything but i'm going this is about what how we got to where we are today and 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 what we've already fought and how we fought it <coughs> so I had this big sum of money that they wanted off me that I couldn't afford. I just couldn't afford it. On top of that, they wanted to reduce my care costs. So it would have been cheaper for them to put in a living care and me have a secondary carer coming in as a double up for just the double up times than to keep sending in all these individual calls. So we tried it, it didn't work and I happened to get a really bad carer. Not all carers are bad, trust me. I've had care for years and there are some amazing carers out there. Sadly, I experienced a really bad carer very early on in trying living care and it frightened the hell out of me and that was it, I wasn't going there again. So when the living carer came in, we had problems. Um, it ended up with a, an emergency call to social services, them coming straight out. And the social worker taking that carer straight to the train station because it was a danger to me to have a stay here. But then that left me with no care. I had no care whatsoever. But I had a choice. I could have another living carer, another stranger come and move into my home who could harm me again. Or maybe, just maybe she'd be nice and do my care. But I was frightened. I was absolutely petrified. It's very hard to ask for help when you're being harmed in your own home and there's nowhere to go to ask for help because you're already in your home in your safe zone. And there's more on that in another video which I will link up here um, regarding keeping yourself safe from bad carers. But again, I emphasize there are so many good carers out there. Don't let the bad ones ruin the reputation of carers because carers are amazing people in, you know, for every bad egg, there is like 20 amazing good carers. <coughs> So, I had no care. Um, I had double up calls, so I was getting, I think it was 15 minute calls twice a day. Now, this is for somebody who's supposed to have 24 hour care. I went down to from 24 hour care, double up calls, to one carer, 15 minutes twice a day. Now, why, why did that happen? Obviously because of the thing, but why could that agency not take my care back on? Because the agency that started with me before I went on to full time care, uh, living care, had all my calls and then they took out, they, they reduced that to just being a double up. Why could they not take all the calls back? They didn't have the staff and they were looking at closing the company down. So that became an issue too. I had to find a company quick because this agency were closing down. Plus, I didn't have care. I didn't have, I only had these 15 minute calls wasn't even enough time to give me my medications properly. Neighbours and everything were coming in and trying to help me. I ended up in the hospital, I was so poorly. The only way we could get me better in the end was actually to fly me out to America to be with John. And John looked after me in America. 
Um, and then I was flown back home, the care agency tried, and they put in an extra call, so I had an, a free call today, and they tried their best. The carers were trying so much, and some carers were trying to come in, were in between calls to try and help out off the books. And they kept me going as much as they could, and, and it was because everybody knew I was going I was about to get married, and then John would be coming over, so everybody tried to push and push and push to keep me as well as they could till John got over. It was a struggle, it was a big struggle, wasn't it? No. There was times that we did think I was not going to make it. Um, there was a lot of hospital missions, a lot of really poorliness, and just not nice, was it? It was not a nice experience. No, it wasn't. Um, and it's because there's a lack of care. There just is a lack of care across the whole, a whole world, whole country. Um, nobody wants to be a carer because the money is crap. At the end of the day, it's crap um, because social services doesn't get enough money from the government to pay for care and most care comes from social services so that set a competition off for the care and set the sort of residents I think that might be the wrong, wrong word but it set the presidents that's the word isn't it yeah, that's really for the level of pricing if you like so um, and, and in many cases the carers are working for less than the living wage and it, it's not right um, and I, I do agree with that, but yeah, they kept those free calls going and then I had neighbours and I had um, the carers trying to come in as and when they could. I looked a mess, I really looked a mess and I was so poorly. <coughs> Just before I flew out to go and get married, my family came and helped me pack and I think it shocked them how poorly I was and how sick I was and I was a mess. But the moment I got out to John, he was amazing. He got me back together again. He got my strength back up. He got my every, all my conditions back under control, and we were doing fine. Um, and then I just we struggled through. Basically, it, it was horrible. It was awful, and we struggled through. When John moved over. We didn't see the point in keeping these 15 minute stupid calls that were doing nothing. They couldn't do anything in 15 minutes. They couldn't dress me and wash me because there was only one carer. They could only give me certain medications in 15 minutes. So that's why I was getting so sick. I couldn't, there wasn't enough time to give me all my medications. And so what we said to that social services is look, John can't work straight away, he needs time to adapt to a new country and then and adapt to my care needs, work out what he can and can't do whilst working. So give us a chance to work that out, give us a couple of months and then we'll start working out what care needs to come in to work alongside John while he's working. They assumed that I cancelled all my care. Full stop, end of story. So when we went back to them saying, right, John's found a job, we know what care we need, we know where we stand, blah de blah rah they were like, well, you don't need care anymore. <laughs> what? So we had a new fight on our hands. Because in their eyes, John was here, I didn't need care. So I had to go straight for a solicitor. I was being refused even to have a care assessment, which is unlawful. You cannot be refused a care assessment. So this was back in, let's go look at the Gmail, October, September, October 2018. The actual email, the reason I say September for October, the letter dated to, the, the notice before action dated to the social worker from the lawyer is November 2018, 16. It's dated November 6, 2016, but it would have taken time to go through the process of trying to make a formal complaint with social services before putting a letter before action in. So, November the 30th, 2016. John is working, full time, and I have no care. Now his work are damn amazing. From day one, they have always been amazing, and I will give Full credit to Curry's. If you are a carer, Curry's is damn amazing and understanding. They have always, always allowed John to adjust his hours as needed to meet my care needs. If he needed to leave work because I'd fallen, 
if he needed to leave work because he needs to give me a medication, if he needed to leave work because Kara's hadn't turned up, he could leave. Without a fight, he could leave. He went back, and that's why they accepted it, because he'd always go back. The only time he didn't go back is if I was really, really poorly. So, 30th of November 2016 is when our legal battle began with social services. One thing to know is that, again, due to cuts from government, it's so hard for disabled people to work out and know what is out there for them to help them. So one, they don't know what they're entitled to from social services, and two, they don't know who to turn to to fight. And this isn't just for social services, for anything. We also had, in between all of this, we had a problem with the council on housing benefit, and trying to find someone to help us fight that, it was hard. There is so many cuts that advocates are hard to find for disabled people. Um, if you have a learning disability, um, it seems to be really easy to find support. If you have, if you're under a certain age, that's easy for support. If you're over a certain age, it's easy to, to find support. If you are a working age disabled person with chronic illnesses or just disabled and no chronic illnesses or just chronic illnesses and no disabilities, you're screwed. You're, you're not important enough. Get over it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there just isn't the funding. The government doesn't give funding. Um, there's nothing out there to support you. Um, there are the odd things, but it's so hard to find it. And when you do find it, there is a huge waiting list. A huge waiting list. So we tried the advocate revenue to work with social services. That wasn't working. <coughs> so we went to the lawyer. So by the time we were, we're now at the lawyer, we're now 30th, 2016, we've done the advocacy, we've done the trying to complain through the advocacy, through the lawyer. We are dealing with two situations. One, they won't assess my care needs, and I have absolutely no care, and John is working full time. Two, I have still got those charges from way back when I first moved in the flat in 2000 and was it 12 or 13 that I moved What's in that? here? When did I move into the flat? We have to say May of 14. She moved in June of 13, 14. So 2014 is when I moved into this flat. So that's the year they started charging me the £68 something. So if you can imagine two years of £68 something a week, how big that bill is. And I haven't paid a penny because I haven't got a penny to pay for it. I had fought it all that time. I'd been complaining, I'd tried to t ask for tribunals, I'd, I'd gone everywhere I could with this. So I had all the letters. The one thing I always tell everybody, never throw any letters away, keep them all together. And as much as possible, get things in writing, emails, letters, not on the phone. On a phone, a phone call can be twisted. Letters can't. Letters are black and white. And trust me, everyone makes mistakes in black and white. Um, so the lawyer took on both cases, both bits. So the fact that they were refusing me a set, uh, care assessment, which was unlawful, and the fact that they were trying to charge me for care and not taking into account my DRE, which was unlawful. Um, and I'm not going to deal with the DRE side of things in this video at all anymore. I've already explained some of that and I'm going to do a dedicated video to that. Uh, it is going to come into this video at certain points because it is part of how we got to where we are. It's part of the legal battle. Um, so then that battle begins and part of it they demand, the lawyers demand that they put, um, enablement care in, uh, which is basically a temporary care for six weeks um, while they find permanent care and while they do the assessments and stuff like that because I was classed as a high risk um, because I, I could, I'm, you know, I hit every box of not being able to do this, this and this. Those boxes we're going to go through in another video on when we look at care assessments for your care needs. Yeah, so finally, social worker come out, see me and John, we've talked about our needs and come back and said, right, you're entitled to this much money, I think you should use it in this way, on these calls at these times, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
And we're like, what? This did not meet our needs in any way. And then the lawyer said to me, have you seen any care plans, any assessments, any... No, I've seen no paperwork. So she asked for these assessments of things. They didn't exist. They just... The lawyer... The, the, the social worker just came up with a random figure. <laughs> and said, right, here's what you're entitled to. Um, so no proper assessment had actually been done. So that was the biggest fight on earth, and it took months, didn't it? Months to get this, these assessments done. Um, and uh, then, and, and in this time, I'm still, I have got really enablement helping me. So I've got three calls a day coming in, and two hours a day of care, but over two calls a day. So I've got a little bit of support coming in, but what the, solic the lawyers are asking for is for a little bit more time in the morning, a little bit more time in the evening, and the two calls in the day to stay for my medications, plus one four hour call a week for me to go out and socialize. Um, and I'm gonna go into the socialize and the trying to fool you that they don't have to do that. In, t in the other video regarding your rights to care and, and, and things like that. Um, so that was a big fight there. Finally they agreed to the care I was needing while John was working. Now remembering that this would be John doing some of my care when he's not at work and the carer's doing care while I, he was at work. I should also add here that we also had to go for a full re-OT assessment to make sure that I was still in need of two carers for hoisting, etc. Somehow, this social worker during this legal battle decided I could be hoisted by one carer. For safety, this is not a wise idea. During the OT reassessment is when we realised that my moulded shower toileting chair had not been service nor had my slings due to lack of care and lack of services nobody had noticed before and they had been being used without being serviced so this became the start of the battle of trying to get somebody to service my equipment that needs to be serviced so that people can safely help me so then the social services it, it took a letter uh, two letters in the end it took another um, juvenile, due denial letter, so uh, uh, basically threatened them totally, this was the like last chance and in two weeks if they did not fix everything it was going straight to the court, it took a like last step before court to get them to do everything because um, they were dragging their heels for a few months um, so the lawyer got annoyed and went yeah, you have this and we'll take you to court in two weeks and we, we were really expecting to go to court, we, we had we were ready to go um, and then ping they found a care agency and ping they got the uh, um, the paperwork done and ping they gave me the hours I required now the agency they employed happened to send in male and female carers and I'm an all-female person I do not like male carers um, and I talk about this in another in a video I talked about earlier, um, which I already put up there on how to keep safe from bad carers because this agency was not a good agency for, for me and they were not a safe agency and the carers were not safe either. Um, some, were, some were amazing and one of them actually featured, I featured one of them in one of my vlogs earlier on, um, V. She was amazing, she was lovely, but all the rest of them were awful. Um, so... They would always send two carers, a male and a female. The male had to stay outside because I'm a no, I'm no male carer. I don't don't have male carers. Other than my husband, I don't want no other male carer. It's personal care. I don't want a male carer. I don't feel comfortable. And you all have the right to say that. And your wishes must be respected. And we'll talk about that as well in the other care needs um, assessment video. But the social worker had passed my care on to an agency she knew would send male and a female carer instead of making sure I had an agency that had two female carers. 
So this became an issue. So now the biggest issue we had was we couldn't find a care agency to meet my care needs. Now this technically wasn't social services fault. Fair enough. I'm angry still because we are, you know, years on from this all being an issue and never being sorted with care before John and from me living in this flat, my care has never been at a point where we feel comfortable. In all this time too, we've also behind the scenes been fighting for my equipment to be sorted so that when my care is finally sorted, we can actually get on and do my care properly and I can have a life. Um, so, what we decided in the end is the care agency they had, we, they were sending a male and a female out, we were waiting for another care agency to come along that would take us on with two female carers. So another care agency came along and they gave us two female carers. Perfect! Brilliant! However, my equipment wasn't ready. So we now have the care in place. And the equipment is still not ready. We've had the hoist installed, but the slings and the shower chair and the have gone at work. Yeah. And the bath, uh, shower and toilet chair is not serviced. It's not serviced. So the inevitable we knew would happen happened. So nobody knows who to fight for this. Nobody knows what to do about this. Um, it's been an ongoing fight. Um, but I knew that what would happen is the care agency would get fed up of coming in and not being able to do their job because the equipment wasn't there. But what happened with that agency is they started not coming in. They just not turn up. And um, that started very, very early on, actually. Normally care agencies, you get a good couple of months of being really good care and then they start slacking. This agency from the very start were really, really bad and they just didn't turn up. So um, I would have to keep calling John home from work. And um, the lawyers are still involved at this point because my care is not solved. I've gone from one agency to another with issues, with the same issues. But, well, kind of different issues but with the same problem results. Um, so the solution was two things. I find my own agency and then social services pays that price no matter how much it is because they can't find an agency. Um, or John give up work. Now John is exhausted by this point. You've got to remember that at this point he has worked full time and done my care full time because he's, he's coming home between work to do my care because these carers can't do it because of the equipment. So we had a long chat with um, advocates and with the social worker and with other people too. Now John felt like he was letting me down. It was, it was hard, it was really, really hard because he felt he was letting me down um, because he's the man of the house he should be able to work and look after me. Now, why couldn't he do it? Why could he not do it? It took a lot of us to get him to understand that my care on its own is a 24 hour job and it's designed for two people. And he's trying to do two people's job by himself as well as work full time for curries. He's doing three people's jobs all by himself. He had nothing to be ashamed of. He was doing amazing. Yes, he was struggling. Yes, he was tired. Yes, he was exhausted. Yes, he was miserable and depressed. But he'd done amazing to get as far as he did. So what we decided between me and John, it had to be mine and John's decision, even though everybody was talking to us, giving suggestions, support, everything. We decided John was gonna give up work and become my full-time carer. I was at a point I couldn't emotionally or physically cope with any more care agencies. I was frightened of them. Um, and John was exhausted of working full-time and doing my care. So I needed my husband to kind of be there. And so that's what we decided to do and I, We'd managed to get him to see that it was okay, it was okay. He, he he didn't have to do both. 
When he went to hand his notice in at work, they kind of spoke to him too because they totally understood the situation, but they didn't want to lose him because he is a really good at his job. So they sort of said, look, is there any way we can work with you to make it that you stay on, even if it's just a few hours a week? So we came back to the social worker in Africa and said, look, is there any way we can make this work? Because they really want to keep him. I personally felt it was good for John. It gave him a break from my care. It kept him in touch with friends. Um, it got him out of the house. There was, there was emotional, mental, um, so many benefits to it. And so it was decided that, yes, three days a week, he'd do eight hours a week. And he spread them over three days. And during those three days, I would have care come in. We're also trying to still get the equipment fixed. So this is where it got left. And now, we're, you know, at this point, we're a year ago or a year and a half ago, something like that. So John gives up work and um, well, gives up full-time work. He and starts part-time work, uh, eight hours a week over three days. We changed the care hours to just cover those calls um, and we used a care agency we found and through the lawyer we got social services to agree to pay the extra money because it's more money than they would normally give you in a direct payment to pay for this care agency seeing as they couldn't find any other care agencies. So here is where we're at. That's where we've been at for a year and a half. Unserviced equipment. John gave up his job to look after me because we couldn't find a care agency to do meet my care needs while he worked. Um, and a care agency coming in that's supposed to do certain things to help John but can't because the equipment's unserviced. So we switch what they do so they do something else they can do to help John um that doesn't need the serviced equipment so right now they're trying they're doing the cleaning um and sometimes they'll help me have a, a upper body wash um or, or or certain other things you know it depends on the day however they're fighting against that but they have no legal ground to fight against that um and i'm going to bring that up in again in the what you're entitled to for your care what this video was very specific in me trying to get to you why we got to the point of cracking the other day why why did we all of a sudden just go smack and crack it wasn't an all of a sudden there has been a big battle going on for my care for several years and this is a hidden world to society in general they don't realize disabled people are constantly fighting for this care and help um with all the cuts that are there there is it is so hard to get legal aid now for disabled people unless it is to do with um discrimination um there is still some legal aid at the moment for certain types of social care um it, it really it's when it breaches your uh human rights then you can get it so it, it's not actually there to fight social care it's there when it breaches certain things like discrimination or, or your human human rights um which in my case it did it left me in an unfavorable living standard um and it put my life in danger so um it breached my human rights as a human there is a saying i am well known for saying to every social worker and i believe it is true in this day and age and it's sad but it is very true in our country, in the UK, we would put a dog down than let it live the way we allow disabled people to live. What do I mean by that? When you have lived in your own home as a disabled per person who is unable to wash themselves, take themselves to the toilet, shower yourself, change yourself, and you've been left for weeks without anybody helping you, and you are dirty because you've had accidents. You are dirty because you're a lady and you have lady problems. You are dirty because you haven't been washed, showered, changed. You're also off your medications because nobody's coming to properly give you your medications. And you end up in a hospital 
because you're so poorly and you are so grateful for the bed they've just laid you in because you haven't been able to get on your bed for weeks on end or months that the only thing you want it's not the food they're offering you or the medication they want you offering you but of course you want the medication but it's the bed you want the bed you want the clean clothes you want the wash it's those little things of human dignity we would not let a dog live like that we would prosecute the person who allowed a dog to live like that however it's perfectly acceptable to allow disabled people in this country to live in those means we treat our feline friends better than we treat our disabled people but the problem is society doesn't see it now because we're not in homes anymore hidden away in a group of homes where we can shout louder together we're all hidden now in our own homes out in society but we're hidden even worse because we're separated from each other we can't talk to each other so we don't have that bigger voice anymore to shout for help we're more isolated and we're more hidden so that's what i mean by disabled people are treated worse than than feline friends and that I, I, I've been well known to say that you wouldn't treat a dog like this and people would be prosecuted for, you know, people would be sent to prison or fined for treating a, treating a dog like this, why not human? Um, I, I have made many comments like that to social workers, to lawyers, and, and I, I generally, you know, it, there's been case after case of it, of dogs being, you know, people being sent to prison or fined or whatever for, for doing horrific things to dogs yet worse is happening to say to disabled people from social services and nothing's being done about it not one thing it's so hard to fight them it's not impossible but it is hard and that's something we're going to look at in the other videos so that's how we've got to john now taking over my care now obviously from the video the other day you now know we've had a new social service review since our equipment has not been serviced ever since that review to this review um and even though we were promised it would be we have the emails and everything we have so much black and white proof of everything between each thing that if we need to we have them we have what we need to go and get the legal help um however you know it's a, it's a new social worker we have to give her the chance um so this is where we're at now we're in the same situation technically as we were a year and a half two years ago um nothing's changed other than we're exhausted um and the little thing that was holding us up that little tiny bit of help that was holding us up is being threatened to pull be pulled from under us because we're not using it for what it was actually put there for because the equipment is not surfaced, which means it's not safe for the carers to use it to help us do what that care is there for. So instead we chose to give the carers things that is safe for them to do, taking that job off John, allowing John then to do this job of two people that he's supposed to have the support of them to do, of the carers to do. Um, we have struggled through and we've done damn well, I think, to get to where we are today. Um, and we will continue to struggle through people. So I've got the OT coming out on the 28th. She's going to assess the situation. I'm hopeful this is going to assess chain sorted. I'm also not hopeful because we've been fighting it for so long. Um, I'm, I have a feeling what's going to happen is the same as what always happens. They just sort of try and sweep it under the carpet and leave us be to try and cope as best we can. <laughs> but um, this, is, this is society nowadays. It, 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 it's sad. Um, but disabled people are left to struggle and I uh, it makes me realize how grateful I am for John because I know how bad it was for me before I had John and I know I now I'm not strong enough or well enough to be fighting that kind of lack of care I don't even want to think about it or make me cry I don't even want to think about the mess I could be in and I think that's what frightened me the other day is them pulling out the care I knew how much that was upsetting John and how much he was considering look I, I just want to go back to work because it'll be easier because they are taking the piss out of me and um i don't know it, it's difficult it's so difficult so 
what I'm going to do in, you know, I, I think this is covered, it, it's such a big thing of how did we get from, how did we get to this position? Um, did we just allow it to happen? No, we didn't just allow it to happen. It's been a long process of fighting. We had lawyers involved, we had this involved, we had that involved. Um, and it's been a long legal battle of different things. Uh, I want to do two more follow-on videos to this video. So this is going to be a series of three videos. One, we're going to look at the um, your right to care. What you're entitled to according to the Care Act. 2015, 14, 2014, what you're entitled to, what, because often you're told, no, we do not cover social care, no, we do not cover cleaning, rubbish, Care Act does not say that, Care Act actually states the opposite, if your needs require it, it's covered, so we're going to look at all of that in one, in one video, and I don't know why I'm going to name it yet, um, but I'll probably link those videos. Once I've made them and got them up, they'll be linked um, via cards. Um, and the other one is going to be about your final assessment for, financial assessment for your DRE. Because this one I want to do separate because it's so, so important. Because this is where social services screw over disabled people the most. I don't know how long this video has become. I know I've had to record quite a lot. I don't know how much I'll have to cut out because I've gone rambling or gone off in the wrong direction. Um, so if it's really, really long, I would have cut this into two parts. I made it part one, part two. I apologize if I've had to do that, but there is so much in this, but it also is to show how much disabled people do have to fight. Now I have the support behind me to help me fight these things. And when I feel low and I'm struggling, there's people behind me going, it's alright Stacey, it's okay, it's okay. Um, there are other disabled people out there who doesn't have that, who don't have that support and don't know where to turn to find that support or help or know where to turn to even get the legal help. And which is why I want to get it out there, the information out there. Um, so what's happening to them? They're being left in the situation I was in. They are being left. There are many disabled people out there who are being left untoileted, unshowered. Um, they are being left without the care needs they need. They are suffering. And they're suffering in silence, not through choice, but because they've got no ability to get out and shout for help. And that would be more sort of explained as to why through the other videos. Why have we become isolated so much and very much so it is to do with everything in in this in this series it all rolls into one um and, and at the end of the day what what's the problem the, the main cause for this problem is cuts government cuts to the amount of money that social services care it gets to cover care costs means that social services are having to find sneaky and crafty ways to make sure that they bring keep the money down that they're spending so they're being really crafty how they do things which means the same people are being left isolated and lonely and suffering and most of society are unaware of it because it's not in their face for them to see it so i'm gonna concentrate on the other two videos now i hope this has sort of highlighted some things as to explaining one where me and john are at in regards to my care needs and the equipment and the fight we've had to get to the point we are today but two to highlight in general the overall fight for, for a decent existence that disabled people have to go through not asking for miracles they're just asking for basics the right for medication to get dressed to get showered and just to be as independent as they can be to survive so thank you for joining me today um i know it's not a fun fun vlog but it's one that i feel is important um so hopefully i managed to get the message across i always worry i don't get the message across or i've rambled in a way that doesn't make sense um and i'm looking forward now to going and doing the other two vlogs with all the laws and important things those are the bits i actually enjoy doing a lot so i will see you tomorrow thank you for joining us in our crazy world bye